renewable fuel standard. Uh, this has been a very successful, a successful policy requires increasing amounts of renewable fuels to be blended in the fuel supply. This could be ethanol, biodiesel, um, other renewable fuels. Um, you know, I think sometimes we hear, oh, the, the RFS, that's a, that's a mandate. You know, when we, when we look at the, when you look at the transportation fuels market, it's a, it's a closed market. Um, renewable fuels, um, we're, we're not able to get access into that market because it's controlled by the, by the petroleum industry. So I think when we look at this, um, it's really more of a market access policy and, and it enables, you know, our, our, the, the, the fuel that our corn goes into um, and other renewable fuels to, to really to have a space to, to, to compete um, in that marketplace. And I think, you know, over, over the years, the, the RFS has been extremely successful, um, not a, particularly for farmers, um, but, but for our energy prices and, and, and for the environment as well. Um, you know, we certainly like to look at, at the emissions that have been reduced by, by blending more renewable fuels, um, you know, both carbon emissions and other pollutants. You know, I think a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, when we talk to, you know, whether it's members of Congress and their staff and others, um, you know, I think there were a lot of concerns when the RFS was enacted, like, well, if we're going to use all of these fuels, we're going to have to plant, you know, a ton more acres to crops and all of this, you know, we're going to convert all of this land um, into ag production. And that's really not happened. Um, the, the total area planted to principal crops is, is, is actually lower um, than when the RFS was, uh, was enacted. Certainly there have been shifts among different crops. Um, but, but I think we really like to try to explain to people that, that this has not resulted in, in huge land use changes. We, we have more corn um, to use for ethanol simply because farmers are, are increasingly more productive. Um, on average, since 2007, um, yields have increased by 25 bushels per acre. That's a nationwide average. But I think that helps to explain to people, um, particularly members of Congress who are not in ag districts um, or ag states, um, that, you know, producing more renewable fuels doesn't necessarily mean, you know, more, more land and ag production. It means that we've been much more productive with, with the land that we're using. And, and that seems often counterintuitive to people, um, but, but I mean, that's, that's really what the data has borne out. Um, you know, most recently, uh, you know, I, it has been certainly um, a busy um, past uh, few years um, in the current administration and with this EPA. Um, it's really been an effort on a, on a number of fronts um, to, um, you know, to, to impact the renewable fuel standard. Um, you know, we've seen um, a, lo a lot of efforts from the oil industry on, on a lot of different fronts, but I think the, the one thing that all of these kind of different things have in common is is really to kind of box ethanol in at at 10 percent of of the fuel supply um that, that's really sort of the, the the end game here it's all about it's all about market share um you know the, the renewable fuel standard um you know you know imply you know 15 billion gallons of of ethanol blending we haven't quite we've never hit that 15 billion gallons um we've sort of remained about 10 percent of the fuel supply maybe a little bit more closer to 11 um, which is about 14.3, 14.4 billion gallons, depending on how much gasoline we're using in a year. Um, but it's really important to have the RFS when we, with all of these waivers that have been granted over the past few years, really, um, you know, impact that requirement to, to blend. And, and when we have something, you know, a product like E15 that can now be sold year round, um, and some of those barriers have been removed, you really need that strong requirement of, of the RFS drives that additional blending through E15 to get to that 15 billion gallons. So that I think that's why we really have been concerned about, about the waivers and, and the impact that those have had. Um, cumulatively, um, you know, 80, 85 waivers to refineries, which basically say you don't, you don't have to meet the requirements to blend um, renewable fuels. Um, and that those over three years have totaled um, 4 billion ethanol equivalent gallons. That's not all ethanol, some of that's biodiesel and, and other renewable fuels, but certainly that, that has an impact and really, really kind of, right, again, sort of boxes, boxes ethanol in at, at that 10%.
Um, so, you know, I, I think as we've, you know, worked on these issues, um, we, we have had some successes and we, and we want to, and those are due, you know, to, you know, advocacy from, from farmers um, across all corn states. Um, I, like I, as I mentioned in 2019, uh, final regulation removing barriers around 15% uh, ethanol blends so that that can be sold um, year round. That's certainly positive. Um, we saw in, in the RFS annual volume rule last year that EPA would finally be required to, um, you know, basically, you know, reallocate any gallons that they waive. So if a, one refinery gets a waiver, somebody else is going to have to make up those, those gallons to kind of keep the requirement whole. Um, you know, we, we really pushed, that was, you know, a, a long time coming um, to kind of address the abuse of waivers. And then we had a, a really good um, win in, in the Tenth Circuit Court, um, which is in Denver. Um, so it kind of covers the Western states. Uh, but, but I think we see that this, that this uh, court decision would apply nationwide and basically says, you know, EPA exceeded their authority in, in granting these waivers. And then most recently this week, um, we saw EPA um, deny um, waivers that refiners had asked for for um, 2011 through 2018, and they had asked for the waivers this year. I, I think anybody looking at that goes, well, how can you waive somebody's RFS requirements from almost 10 years ago? That's pretty ridiculous. And so, uh, you know, we were glad to see EPA kind of take those off of the table and, and indeed kind of deny, deny those waivers. Um, despite that progress, you know, we, we still have some work to do to continue to hold, um, you know, this EPA accountable. Um, we, we do need them, you know, to, um, to apply this court decision. Um, that, that court case was brought by, by NCGA, um, the Renewable Fuels Association, National Farmers Union, and American Coalition for Ethanol. So um, I think we were, you know, we were on the winning side of that, and, and we believe it's important for EPA to apply that. That would essentially shut down just about all all of these RFS waivers. Um, so there are there are waivers that continue to be pending for for 2019 and 2020 RFS compliance. Um, and then we also have some commitments that the administration made after they had granted a lot of these waivers and and heard from farmers that this is a big problem. Um, they had made some commitments around removing some additional labeling and infrastructure barriers to E15. Um, President recently made some additional comments about that. Um, but, but again, you know, we, we want to see that actual action to follow through on this. Um, and, and we just haven't seen that yet. So those are some of the issues that we are going to continue to work on around the RFS. Um, I think another issue that we're working on, you know, so we have, you know, we, we continue to um, see a lot of value in the market access provided by the RFS, particularly if you, if the, if the RFS was really used to its full potential of that 15 billion gallons to, to drive that extra demand. But, but we also look at how, how do we build on the success here? How do we keep moving forward? Um, how do we um, get, get to a place where we're using higher blends of ethanol? Um, a proposal, um, a policy that, that corn growers have been working on, you know, with, with ethanol producers, with automakers, and with other stakeholders is really to figure out, you know, how, how do the engine technologies that um, automakers want to use and using those in conjunction with better fuels um, can make uh, vehicles more fuel efficient and reduce emissions, which are two things that automakers are required to do. Um, what, what we've come up with, and you know, there's been a lot of outside research and, and a lot of work that's come in, gone into this, and we've kind of picked that up. And we are have working on legislation um, with a member of Congress from Illinois that um, has had some delays this year, a lot, a lot kind of due to you know, Congress being going in a lot of different directions with COVID. But, but I think we're getting close to, to having legislation to introduce. Um, this legislation would increase the octane level of, of gasoline, and it would require that um, sources of octane going into fuel um, have lower carbon emissions. This really, so it's not a, it's not necessarily a requirement to use ethanol, but we've really kind of set up the guardrails here where, where ethanol would be the, the octane um, source of choice. Um, and, and, you know, hoping, you know, really looking at how that, 
you know, this is a very forward looking policy. This, this is not something that is going to start increasing ethanol demand next year, but, but this is really to look at how we can support long term corn demand um, through higher ethanol blends uh, that, that deliver these benefits for, for automakers. And, and more broadly for the environment. This will be a long-term transition. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's pretty complicated. But I, I, you know, I think you know, from NCGA standpoint, if we don't go ahead and get started on this, um, you know, we're not ever going to get there. So uh, that, that is um, the legislation that, that we have been working on. Um, I will say I won't be able, you know, not I don't think about cover all the details here, but I would encourage you if you have some time, um, ncga.com slash octane. We have a lot of resources um, on on the NCGA website. There's some really great, great videos um, that that explain um, you know some of these engine technologies. Uh, so if you're you know into that, we've got I've got a couple of engineers um, who who've done some videos with us, some grower grower leaders that have done you know that, and a lot of it really great material. Um, so would certainly encourage everybody to you know to to check that out and and learn more about this legislation. You know, really the benefits here for high octane fuel is you you increase v, you know fuel efficiency by at least five percent. Um, this is certainly, you know, something that automakers are being pushed to do, and I think we want to be part of that solution. Um, if you have a low carbon requirement and you're allowing higher blends of ethanol, you also get very pretty substantial um, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, you know, I think, again, I think we all know the benefits of ethanol here. It has a very high octane rating, um, making it a very efficient source to increase octane. And, and on the cost side, um, ethanol is significantly less expensive than gasoline. If, um, if refineries wanted to use petroleum-based sources to increase gasoline octane, that's very expensive for them um, to do that. It would add a lot, a lot to the cost of gasoline, not to mention the um, additional emissions that would result in. So I think there's a, you know, I think we look at this and say though, there's a very clear, a very clear advantage for for ethanol um, here um, to, to be part of this solution. So you will be, you know, hopefully you take some time to encourage you to learn more about this. Happy to certainly talk to, talk to anybody um, to, to follow up um, and we'll certainly be, um, hopefully have this legislation introduced, introduced soon and that will kind of give us, you know, kind of give something, give us something to work around um, and, and, and try to build support here with, with a wide range of stakeholders. Um, and just very briefly, I think just kind of talking about, right, how do we build more support for, for ethanol um, in Congress? I think regardless of, of the policies that corn growers want to pursue um, and, and really to, to do that successfully, I, I think we really need, I think we've found that we really need to Make sure we're we're engaging with with members of Congress, you know, certainly ones from agriculture states and agriculture districts, but more broadly about the the benefits of renewable fuels and really kind of reengaging and reintroducing people here. I, you know, there is a lot of interest in in Congress, um, particularly in the House, about addressing climate change and reducing emissions. There, there are some people who really just kind of want to skip up, you know, let's just skip past renewable fuels and go on to the latest and greatest of what's next and new. And, and, and I think we really, uh, you know, have, have some work cut out for us um, to really position ethanol as an immediate solution to reducing emissions. Um, it's certainly more, more affordable. And um, if, 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 if members of Congress are really serious about you know, reducing emissions and addressing these issues, you don't want to leave any of that on the table. And um, expanding the use of renewable fuels really allows you to start implementing those solutions right now. Um, and, and so I, I think that's that's really kind of the work that, that we're trying to do more broadly in Congress. And, and so certainly welcome, you know, welcome everybody's assistance on that um, to, to help us build up more supporters. I think if you look at, at, at the chart, it really shows you um, the, you know, the, as you know, the carbon intensity for ethanol continues to go down um, for gasoline, it's continuing to go up. 
um, there, there's potential for, for ethanol to, to continue to get better. A lot of that um, because, of, because of farming practices, um, because of efficiencies in ethanol plants. Um, so we have a really good, a really good positive story to tell um, about, about really how ethanol can be part of the solution. And, you know, I think finally, yeah, I, I think this also kind of illustrates, you know, some of the, um, you know, what we try to, what, what we try to show people is we've got ethanol production going up, but yet planted corn acres, and this is 2018, but, you know, I think it's, you know, we've kind of been in similar ranges have, have gone down and not up. And, and that's because of that increase in, in yield. Um, so certainly, um, you know, farmers are able to help meet this need and we don't wanna leave these emissions reductions on the table as we continue to look for, you know, the best ways to address these um, issues. So I am going to um, stop there. I know that was a lot of ethanol really quickly. And we will go over to um, Leslie uh, McNitt, who is gonna give us a trade update. Thanks, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about trade. Um, I, we're just gonna take a little walk down memory lane for some of you, I'm sure, but I always think it's helpful to have a reminder about why trade is important to us. So um, Mike in particular, you've probably heard me say this a million times, but I uh, hope, brace yourself for a million and one. Um, so, so trade is a really important demand driver for corn and for corn products. So we talk a lot about value added uh, corn products, whether it's ethanol, DDGs, um, you know, I know beef is a really important example in Colorado, um, and um, other feed products. So, um, you know, 95% of the world's customers live outside the U.S., and we want them to buy our stuff. It's that simple. Um, when we look at, you know, the, the global market, we export about 15% of our annual corn crop. That's just direct corn. So when you talk about exports of value added products and break them down into their corn equivalent, um, that jumps to closer to 25% of the annual crop that ends up getting exported. Um, uh, NCGA and the US Grains Council, as you know, work very closely together on trade. And um, we have commissioned studies every time USDA updates its data. And the most recent numbers we have, we're actually in the process of updating this now, but our 2016 numbers, um, and looking at the impact on Colorado, um, corn and corn product exports were valued at 178.5, not dollars, there should be a million there, million dollars in 2016. So um, exports, you know, produce a tremendous economic value to your state. Um, those exports supported 1,853 jobs in Colorado. Um, and so, you know, it's a really important part of, of your bottom line as farmers to make sure that your products are competing in key markets around the world. And, and that's why we focus so much on trade. Next slide, please. Okay, so we, um, as you know, and thanks to, to you for your advocacy engagement, you know, we've been in a little bit of a defensive posture on trade for the last few years. Um, we've been really focusing on preserving our market access in top priority markets. So whether that's, you know, expanding trade in Japan, um, preserving our relationship with Korea, or I think most importantly, staying in NAFTA and then ultimately passing the new USMCA trade agreement with Mexico and Canada. You know, those have been key successes, but it's also been a, a real focus on preserving the market access that we already have in our top export markets. So as we, you know, got some of, not some of those wins under our belt, um, I guess you could consider the phase one deal with China a win as well. Um, we started looking at, you know, what are our trade policy priorities moving forward? And we really have sort of four key pri priority uh, policy areas of focus when it comes to trade. The first is getting back on offense, new markets, new agreements. And that's all about diversifying your portfolio around the world so that we're not overly reliant on any one market. Um, and, and that, you know, corn farmers are, are competing in the parts of the world that are growing in their demand the most rapidly. Um, and Southeast Asia is really an important focal point there. Um, you know, it's a, I'll get into a little bit more about why in a moment, but 
It's a really important region. Um, and so it's really making sure that we're also pushing our government to pivot and consider the importance of Southeast Asia and its, in its strategy. Um, and promoting ethanol export expansion is another huge component of new markets and new agreements and that getting back on offense. Um, you know, ethanol exports are a huge opportunity um, and, and we wanna do what we can to, um, to help support and facilitate that vision on the policy side at NCGA. Um, the second focus area is mitigating trade barriers. I think that one speaks for itself, but you know, typically um, issues that we face on the regulatory side with other nations, um, you know, barriers to biotechnology, uh, barriers to, you know, or, or I guess a lack of harmony in, in um, maximum residue levels for pesticides. Um, and, and those are types of examples that we see probably the most frequently that can serve as, as trade disruption. Um, and then implementation and enforcement of USMCA, the Japan uh, first phase deal and the phase one China deal um, and making sure, you know, enforcing those agreements, making sure that our trading partners do what they say they're going to do and that, um, you know, those agreements um, do what we expect them to do. And then finally, increasing investment in the Market Access Program, MAP, and the Foreign Market Development Program, FMD, which is always a major farm bill priority. Um, it's something that I always keep in our top tier priorities, whether it's a farm bill year or not, because it's really important, um, I think, for us to not lose sight of that one in particular. And MAP and FMD, of course, are funded through and authorized through the farm bill and support a lot of the great work that our partner, the U.S. Grains Council does um, to do the, the foreign market development um, and increase your competitiveness and market access around the world. So um, that's a really important partnership. So that's another major priority. Next slide, please. So now I'll dive a little bit into um, some of the hot topics that we're, um, that we're focusing on that you may be reading about or hearing about um whether it's through you know uh the press or through ncga updates um you know things that that you're thinking about um and i'll talk a little bit about how they kind of fit within those buckets so i mentioned the pivot to southeast asia um i'll talk a little bit about why that's important the southeast asia and oceania region encompasses about 13 countries with a total population of 702 million people. Um, it's a relatively stable region and the total animal feed market is estimated to be about 118 million metric tons. So we know that there's, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, protein demand in this region. There's a lot of energy demand. The region's energy demand has grown by 60% over the past 15 years. Um, and it's just, it's rapidly growing. You're seeing middle class, uh, incomes rise, middle class growth, protein demand, feed demand in turn, energy demand. And so it's just a really important region to um, make sure that, you know, we're capturing that demand um, for the U.S. And we have a lot of competitors also looking to capture that demand in that region. So that's why it's really important that we continue to raise um, more engagement with Southeast Asia on the um, trade policy agenda. And it's something that I try and talk about in, you know, every conversation as a top priority, um, whether it's, you know, with members of Congress or, or with the administration. Um, and as we think about, you know, the post-election environment here in town, whether we're dealing with a second uh, term of the Trump administration or a first term of the Biden administration, this is going to be something that we're going to really want to try and get on their trade policy agenda. Um, and, and make this a priority. Um, and then the next, the next, and, and sorry, so that falls under new markets, new agreements. Um, the next issue is the Brazil ethanol TRQ, which stands for tariff rate quota. Um, this is an issue that we, that the Grains Council has been leading on. We've been working um, with, with them and with the ethanol industry on this issue for a while. Um, and I would say this falls under trade barriers as well as ethanol expansion in terms of our overall priorities. Um, Brazil's our top, has been our top export market for ethanol. And, um, you know, we typically think of Brazil as a competitor and it is, but um, it's also an important importer of ethanol. 
since about 2017, um, we Brazil instituted a, a tariff rate quota of 600 um, uh, million liters, uh, meaning that anything beyond any any imports beyond that level would have a 20% tariff on them. That's how the TRQ works, and we definitely export more than that to Brazil. So, um, you know, that would make our ethanol less competitive. So um, there's been a long fight, you know, this, the TRQ was meant to, was not meant to be permanent, it was meant to expire. Um, there was a long fight to try and get that tariff removed. Um, and the US government has, has, you know, stepped up its engagement on this issue with Brazil. Um, but that, you know, that new trade barrier became pretty popular with Brazil's sugarcane industry. And so, you know, their domestic politics were a little bit challenging to get this resolved. Um, there was a high level meeting, oh, I guess it was about a year ago between um, Presidents Trump and Bolsonaro. Um, one of the outcomes of that meeting was to raise the TRQ to 750 million liters. Uh, marginal improvement, but still not, you know, not the same thing as having um, duty free market access. And I'll note that, you know, Brazilian ethanol has pretty much has duty free market access in the US. And so we're really looking for a level playing field there. Um, so the recent action that you probably heard about is that um, on August 31st, the TRQ expired. Um, and that meant that we went to a flat 20% tariff on all ethanol exports to Brazil, which is incredibly prohibitive um, and really would shut us out of the market. And so, um, you know, we really pushed back hard on that and um, the administration was able to negotiate behind the scenes with the Brazilians to extend the TRQ for another 90 days. Um, during that time, um, the intent of, you know, the way the two governments are going to spend that time is to negotiate market access. Um, and the, their statement says on ethanol and on sugar, so they're going to talk about what a mutually beneficial relationship looks like. And um, we all are going to use that time to press them to, you know, to uh, eliminate this tariff once and for all. Um, that's still our definition of success. So that's, that process is just starting now, but that's, that's the goal is getting rid of the 20% 20, 20 tariff. Um, Another issue that fall, I would say falls under um, implementation, uh, monitoring implementation and, enforce, implementation and enforcement of a trade agreement, as well as trade barriers, are some of the regulatory issues that we're experiencing with Mexico around crop protection and biotechnology products. Um, and we've seen an ideological shift in among um, Mexican government officials. This, this is kind of a key element of some of the officials that um, President AMLO put into place. They are um, very anti-industrial agriculture. They're anti-innovation in ag, anti-foreign you know, foreign ag imports. They're very populist in nature. Um, and we've seen um, the environment ministry has issued um, rejection, has been rejecting import licenses for glyphosate. Um, and their commission that regulates biotechnology products for import has not moved since May of 2018. So they haven't, they've just left product applications languishing. Um, now these, uh, and, and they're citing the precautionary principle, which is Europe's ideology and its approach to regulating agricultural products as its basis, which is, is signature when it comes to the, um, you know, understanding that this is ideological and this is very concerning. Um, this has not disrupted any any corn exports yet. So these have not served as trade barriers yet. Um, but it's a this is a troubling directional shift. Um, obviously, our friends in the crop protection industry are very concerned. Um, and then most recently, Mexico um, has has um, some Mexican officials have said that they will be issuing decrees. Um, one which will ban glyphosate or phase out glyphosate's use by 2024 and study alternatives or work to develop alternatives. And um, the, other, the other is you know, considering another 80 products. And then the third would be a ban on GMO corn. And 
Mexico already does not allow for cultivation of GMO corn. What we don't know is whether this decree will ban all uses and, and have an impact on imports or whether it will simply be uh, you know, formalizing the ban that is already, has already been de facto and been in place in Mexico for many years. Um, this is one of the things that, that I have spent my, the most of my time on in the last six months. Um, the, we've been working very hard, doing a lot of meetings on Capitol Hill, doing a lot of meetings with USTR and USDA. In fact, John Doggett was on a, a second meeting um, with, with Ambassador Dowd and Undersecretary McKinney earlier this week on this issue. We're partnering with the Grains Council, with uh, American Soybean Association, CropLife America, and Bio on this. Um, and you know, it's elevated to very, very high levels, the highest levels at USDA, um, at USTR, in the White House, EPA is engaged in making sure that this does not become a major trade um, disruption between the U.S. and Mexico, particularly as USMCA just went into effect. Um, so we've been pushing really hard on this. Um, there is work behind the scenes to try and prevent these decrees from ever seeing the light of day, um, but we don't totally know what's going to be in them or if they'll be published. Plan B, if a, if a political level solution doesn't work out, plan B is to um, move to dispute settlement. And what I will say about that is, well, this is not ideal, considering how hard you all worked and we all worked to get USMCA passed. The benefit of having USMCA in, in, in force is that it strengthens our SPS commitments and it strengthens our biotech commitments. And it's likely that the SPS agreement would be the basis for a legal challenge and a, and a dispute settlement process. So it does strengthen our legal basis for taking a case against Mexico if that's what the government needs to do. Um, but we're hoping that we can avoid that lengthy, uh, that lengthy and, and expensive process. Um, so just please rest assured that we're really doing everything we can to kind of nip this issue in the bud before it becomes something that, that challenges your ability to um, continue to export a quarter of our corn uh, exports to Mexico. Um, on China, I'll just give you a very, for the sake of time, very brief update on where we stand with respect to phase one implementation. The uh, China's, you know, we had the purchase agreements and then we also had um, the more structural and regulatory agreements um, as part of the phase one deal with China. Um, there's pretty significant process being made on the, on the uh, more structural reforms on the agriculture side, um, things that, that impact other sectors of the industry. We're still waiting to see and, and China has more time to see how they um, amend their biotechnology uh, regulatory process, which is really one of our key uh, key wins within the phase one agreement. On the purchases front, we're seeing China has really fallen behind pace on its purchase commitments across all sectors. But when it comes to corn, they're purchasing a ton of corn. We have seen some actually ship on boats and, and you know, obviously we're waiting to make sure that the corn actually, uh, that the corn that they've purchased actually moves. But um, we're talking almost 8 million metric tons in, purchase, in purchases for the 2021 crop, which is a record. I mean, it's huge. So um, we're seeing a lot of corn purchases, but you know, they're purchasing a lot of few prod products. They're not purchasing ethanol. They're not purchasing DDGs. Um, we're very, we think that ethanol is a huge opportunity and we've pushed really, really hard to get ethanol into the phase one agreement. And to make the case that, I mean, the, China can really move the needle toward its purchase requirements by purchasing a billion gallons of ethanol. Um, and, but there is a, a lingering 15% tariff there that I think is, is really prohibitive. So that's a priority to get that removed and to then move into, um, move toward a more reliable trading relationship longer term with China. Um, I don't have a lot to say on US, UK, except for that these negotiations are ongoing. There have been three rounds of negotiations. The agriculture issues like chlorinated chicken and biotechnology remain unresolved. Um, and there are bigger picture conversations about, you know, um, ensuring that um, the UK holds up the Good Friday Agreement, which is, um, you know, all about the, the political um, and sovereign relationship um, that has kept peace within the region, you know, um, between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, and so we, that is, if Congress is ever going to vote on this, that's, that's a demand of theirs that that 
remain in place. Um, and this is not expected to be completed before the negotiation. So those are kind of the, the core issues um, that we're focusing on. Um, and then there are always other cats and dogs like WTO reform and fun things like that. But those have really been hot topics recently. Um, and then just very quickly, just moving on to the next slide, I just a reminder of some of the things that NCGA invests in programmatically through the market development action team that facilitate our trade objectives. Things like the Farmers for Free Trade, um, Ag Talks Town Hall, these virtual town halls have been, um, they just wrapped up, there were five of them, and that's focused on really keeping agriculture, agricultural trade um, on the agenda and on the radar when we've got coronavirus and the election happening, it's important. We don't lose sight of why trade is important. Um, and you know, it's sort of a, a, a new initiative um, after the success of their motorcade for trade in, in helping get USMCA passed. Um, we also have trade school, um, which is all about, you know, building um, education and, and support for trade. Um, we're part of the uh, U.S. Um, Coalition to Protect U.S. Ag Exports. This is a MAP and FMD coalition um, that the action team funds to make sure that we promote MAP and FMD um, collectively throughout the ag community. Um, and then, of course, the Maisal Initiative, which is our partnership with the Grains Council uh, and corn farmers from Brazil and Argentina to promote acceptance of biotechnology and, and crop protection products around the world and eliminate regulatory trade barriers. So those are a few core programs that support our trade policy objectives. And with that, I'll stop talking. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And um, Kathy and Leslie. Uh, we have one more speaker today, and that's Sarah Henry. And so please, Sarah, take it away. And afterwards, we'll open it up for questions. And if you do have questions, don't uh, feel uh, shy. Type them right into the Q&A, and we will get them in front of our panelists to answer. Without further ado, Sarah, take it away. Thanks, Nick. Um, really quick, I just wanted to talk about a few infrastructure issues that um, are top of mind for NCGA and um, are really important um, to uh, the success um, of, of our, our operations for our members. So um, to take advantage of the great um, trading opportunities and trading markets that Leslie just uh, described and, and went over, uh, it's obviously important for our growers to get their product to um, to export. So over 50% of our corn um, in the United States um, is trans that is exported is transported on the inland waterway system. Um, so there's over 12,000 miles of navigable of navigable locks, um, over 240 lock sites that moves corn to 38 states uh, via the Mississippi, Missouri, Illinois, and Ohio rivers. Um, and so um, it is important to um, our competitiveness with other countries as far as um, exporting and producing our corn. Um, and so it keeps us uh, competitive with countries like Brazil and Argentina that are quickly working to produce corn, as much corn as the United States does. Um, however, they don't have the infrastructure of, of the inland waterway system like the United States does. They rely heavily on rail and um, truck transportation. And just to put that quickly in perspective for you all, um, to transport 1,500 tons of corn, um, that's one barge, um, that's 15 jumbo hopper train cars, um, and 58 large semis. Um, so the inland waterway system is by far the most effective um, way for us to move our product quickly. Um, and so, as you can see, um, the navigation lock and dams are in desperate need of repair. Um, so when the locks and dams were built, they had a lifespan of 50 years um, and over 60% of the current locks that are um, working right now have exceeded that lifespan by 10 years. Um, and so when our transportation on the inland waterway system um, is being backlogged, um, that makes uh, the transporting of that product more expensive for the shippers as well as the, the, the farmers that are taking their uh, product to, to be exported there. 
So um, the, the locks and dams are constructed and maintained by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and the way that we regulate that um, is through what's called the Water Resources Development Act, WERDA for short. Um, so it's reauthorized every two years through Congress and it sets policy for the inland waterway system and the construction of those locks and dams. Um, and so this is being reauthorized this year in 2020. Uh, and the big ask for um, NCGA is a cost share change of the construction account. Um, so right now it's at 50% general revenue, 50% inland water rate trust fund. Um, and the general revenue is essentially government funding. Um, so we, Congress, took uh, an exception for um, the Olmstead Lock and Dam, which is on the Ohio River um, in between Illinois and Kentucky. Uh, they made a cost share change of 7525, which allowed the lock and dam to get done um, four years ahead of the projected date and saved over $300 million. And so we are currently asking Congress to make um, an exception for indefinitely um, the lock and dam construction account to change it to 7525 from the 5050. Uh, right now, the House has made. Um, bill language that has a cost share change of 6535 um, and the set with a seven year sunset. Um, and then uh, the Senate has as well the 75 or the 6535. Um, and so um, this uh, has not been passed on the floor yet between the House and the Senate, but it is something that we are monitoring and something that is a, a big issue for NCGA. Um, and then I'll just move really quickly to rural broadband, um, which I know is something that is top of mind for folks, um, especially in the time of COVID. So 18 million Americans lack access to reliable internet um, and 14 million of those Americans live in rural communities. Um, I know since the time of COVID, um, lots of folks have been trying to work from home, um, schools from home, uh, which is really hard when you don't have internet. And so um, there's some agriculture companies that have been stepping up to the plate, such as Lando Lakes, such as Nutrien, to turn on rural broadband um, capabilities in those areas. Um, there are numerous coalitions that have been started. Microsoft has gotten involved um, as well uh, and just wanted to draw to attention. Um, in 2018 Farm Bill, uh, there was authorize a task force uh, between the FCC and the USDA to hopefully get to the bottom of this. It's included with um, internet companies as well as farmers, as well as farm organizations. And so they're really bringing that, that conversation to the forefront. Um, there are a handful of bills that have been released um, as far as broadband, but it's something that uh, we are um, definitely monitoring something that we are uh, making sure that our growers and our members have a have a conversation and a voice in. So um, just wanted to draw that to y'all's attention as well. And I think in the effort of time, that's that's where I'll wrap up there. All right, well, thank you very much, Kathy, Leslie, and Sarah for that great presentation on what's happening and what's impacting farmers across uh, Colorado and this great nation. We do have a couple questions in the chat, so I'm going to start off with those. And the first question comes from Kim Redden, uh, and it's for Leslie. Uh, how much of the China purchases have been realized uh, in, uh, versus just commitments to buy? That is a great question. Um, I don't have a total aggregated answer for you, Kim, but I can get back to you with that answer. Um, most of the purchases have been for the 2021 crop. So um, I can tell you that we what has been moving has been in the thousands of metric tons um, denominations, if you will. Um, and there have been a few shipments that I'm aware of, but for the most part, um, we're, we're talking like 8.7 million metric tons worth of purchases. Um, I think overall, which is huge, but most of it has not shipped yet. But I'll get back to you with an actual number. I know that, you know, Carrie and Reese at the Grains Council are tallying that up all the time. I've been tracking the purchase commitments, um, but don't have an up-to-date number on what's actually been shipped. So I'll get back to you on that. 
Great, thank you so much, Leslie. Uh, the next one is from Mike Lefever. You ladies may know him. Uh, and this is for Sarah. And his question is, is, has the government actually committed monies to replace, rebuild, or just maintain the locks and dams? And is there any idea when that may start, act, when they may actually start construction? Yeah, good question, Mike. So Mike actually joined um, a couple of us last year, I think it was last year, um, on a lock and dam tour with the Army Corps. So he got to see kind of firsthand uh, just how, how much our lock and dams are needing repair. Um, so good question. There's actually a planned shutdown happening right now, Mike, um, on the Mississippi River. Uh, and they are repairing a handful of locks and dams right now. Um, actually, we are traveling there at the end of this month um, to see the locks and dams under construction, uh, which is great. Um, and so uh, we'll be able to see kind of what they're doing, the progress that they're making. But but they are um, they are making some progress on on fixing those locks and dams and repairing them as much as they can. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll be able to report back um, how that's going um, after we take a visit there um, the last week of, of September. Great, thank you all. At this point, we don't have any questions in the queue. So if you do have some questions, uh, feel free to type them in. Um, but I do have a question for Kathy and this kind of goes back to some of the news that we heard this earlier this week about the small refiner exemptions and uh, President Trump asking the EPA to dismiss them uh, and then hearing from the EPA that they did. Uh, on the surface, that looks great, but on the underlying current, you know, where does that leave us? Uh, how, much, how much of this is still exposed because of uh, maybe some lack of solid footing or, or foundations that, that the SRE exemptions that were just denied uh, are there so that we know that we're not supposed to rest on our laurels? Yeah, I think that, Nick, that's a good question. You know, I, I think, you know, yes, we appreciate the action that EPA took this week. Um, when you look at the waivers that, that they denied, these are waivers that oil refineries asked for this year, but waivers covering prior obligations from 2011 through 2018. Um, you know, so, you know, and I think the, the attempt here by, was by refineries to really get around that court decision in our favor and to show that they've had a consistent string, string of waivers in place so that they continue, can, can, can continue to get them. Um, so, yes, it was absolutely important for, for EPA to deny these waivers. I think when we look at this, it, you know, most people would look at it and be like, of course they had to deny these waivers. That It's ridiculous, you know, to waive something from, from nine years ago. Um, so, so I think that's positive to, to take those off the table um, and, and just kind of take that cloud of uncertainty and, you know, away and remove it. I think that that does still leave us with um, pending waiver petitions for for 2019 and 2020 RFS obligations, and and, and those really really kind of remain on hold. I think as as EPA continues to look at how do they apply this um, you know court decision on waivers that said you know no EPA you exceeded your authority, um, so so there is still some unfinished business there. And, and so I think it's been a little bit of a balancing act. I think we want to, we certainly want to be appreciative of, of what the administration has, has done here on, on these past year waivers. Um, but we, we also want to be, you know, also need to be realistic that, that there is still some questions remaining on, you know, how, how kind of the current year waivers are going to be addressed. I think we think that, you know, kind of once, um, the, 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 there, there's some upper, you know, the refiners had an opportunity to ask for some further review of this court decision. We, we think that's, you know, going to be resolved. I think once we maybe get to that point, hopefully these things move in the right direction. But, you know, I, I don't think we want to just rely on, you know, on, on everybody doing the right thing. Um, we want to, you know, I think we're going to continue to be engaged with, you know, with the administration and with our, you know, strong supporters in Congress to make sure that the, that the right outcome happens here because, um, you know, it's, you know, on the one hand, we see the administration doing positive things, you know, on, 
on E15 or, you know, on these gap year waivers, but then often that is offset by, you know, by something not positive on, on the other side. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's really been a, you know, keeping, you know, keeping that balance um, and, you know, making sure at the end of the day, we're, we're not coming out behind where we're moving forward. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we do have a couple more questions that came in. Uh, first one was from Mike again, regarding uh, the shutdown of the river. Uh, how do you move corn when the river is shut down? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, yes, Mike, I was just typing you a note back. Um, so that is a very good question. They are doing some diverting and moving corn in some other ways for the time being. Um, I will tell you that they are set to conclude the construction on those lock and dams. Um, they timed it with um, harvest and moving that, those products. So um, they will be done October. Um, and so uh, it'll be done just in time for that. Um, but I can follow up with, with some more specifics for you on that, but um, it, it will be done very soon. It was just shut down for the summer um, in just for a short period of time. Great. And the next question is from Rod Hahn and it probably back to Sarah as well. Uh, with over 90% of the corn in Colorado transported by truck due to our lack of navigable waterways, uh, and with most of our money going to the front range because that's where the population density is, you know, how can the farm enlist help from NCGA uh, so that we have the roads and infrastructure that we need to get our products to market? Sure. Um, also a good question. Um, so I'm sure you've been seeing um, in the news and in the press um, this year in 2020 that um, they've been trying to pass a major infrastructure bill, um, which includes highways and roads and bridges um, and, and money for that. Um, it's unfortunately right now, it's something that has been a little bit of a political push through Congress. Um, it's um, very decisive issues on both sides of the aisle. And so that's something that NCGA has been very vocal about uh, with our, our folks and our friends here in DC and making sure that rural communities are, are being taken care of in this um, and that it's not something that is just uh, focused on urban spaces and, and spaces where um, there's a population explosion, um, like uh, you put it, Rod. So um, that is something that we are monitoring that we are focusing on is, is making sure that rural America is, is included and in, is Front of mind for those folks. So um, I can follow up with specifics with you as well um, and, and let you know about that. Great, Sarah. And, and just kind of a, a follow up to that from, from me before we get to probably our last question because we are getting close on time and I want to be respectful of getting everybody uh, to where they need to be after this. Uh, is, what is there, what is there that can be done when it comes to weights and lengths of trucks to maybe haul more corn in a, in a semi? Um, knowing that the, the weight limits have kind of been frozen nationwide, but there has been some exemptions granted. And what is the process that we could possibly go through to maybe inc uh, increase that here in Colorado? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you did. You did hit on an important part there that it has been um, exempted a little bit through the time of COVID, uh, making sure that our supply chain is not disrupted um, at all. And so, uh, unfortunately, I don't know the specifics on getting that Um permanently exempted, um, permanently changed in specifically um, Colorado. I can work with our folks. Um, we are a part of a lot of coalitions here um, that focus a lot on transportation. Um, and so I can, I can check into that, Nick. Um, I can follow up with you and, and kind of talk more about that with you. Um, Cause I do know that's something that is important for those states that are um, using the inland waterways right away, <laughs> that it's not, a little bit more landlocked, but um, I can follow up with you definitely on that. That'd be great. And so our, our last question uh, is from Rod as well, and it deals with um, port involvement in the chemical registration process. And is that becoming a hindrance to the EPA and, and farmers when it's impacting the products and uh, protecting or chemical protectants that they need to do in their, use in their operation? And that can be for anybody to end this on. 
I will, I'd, yeah, I, we can certainly, um, I, I know some folks may know Colleen on our staff. Um, she, you know, has been tracking a number of these uh, crop protection um, product issues with, with some of these re-registrations at, at EPA. There have been, right, some, some ongoing um, legal actions around these products. Um, but and, and, and NCGA has has taken a role in in a number of those. I think with with exactly with that aim, with with making sure that we protect farmers' access to to these products and advocating for for, for sound science to to be used through these processes. And, and we'll certainly certainly continue to do that. Um, you know, I don't think we we you know expect these issues to go away. And, and so we certainly have to remain continue to remain remain involved in, in right, protecting farmers' access, uh, making sure that, that the science is, is being followed. And then by extension, you know, I think as Leslie mentioned with, with Mexico, you know, making sure that, that you know, in, in the international marketplace, that, 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 you know, that, that, you know, kind of our policies are being, being respective and, and that others are, are living up to their, their agreements. So um, certainly it continues to be an important area for focus. Well, thank you very much, Kathy, Leslie, and Sarah. On behalf of Colorado Corn, uh, we appreciate you coming on and talking about the issues that are uh, being faced in DC that are going to be impacting agriculture and corn farmers here in Colorado and across the nation. And so again, thank you so much. And for everybody who joined us this morning, thank you so much for taking an hour of your time. We really appreciate you coming on and hopefully you garnered something from this this morning and learned a little something new. I know I always do. And I uh, just wanted to announce that our next uh, webinar is going to be next Wednesday, the 23rd. It's gonna start at 7.30 bright and early in the morning. And we're going to have Ryan Legrand of the United States Grains Council talk about the work that they're doing overseas to open markets for our corn and our corn products uh, to talk to increase that actual output that Leslie was talking about on the policy side and what's happened since COVID, how it's impacted us, and what we're going to be doing in the future to increase those exports to foreign markets. So again, Kathy, Sarah, Leslie, thank you for joining us. And again, to everybody, thank you for hopping on this webinar this morning. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Nicholas. Yeah. Nice to see everybody.